on the on the football side and, and real football side in Scotland they couldn't match the Hibs. We were the team. Fourteenth of September, 1955, the very first European Cup. The idea had come from a French newspaper called L'Equipe. Get the best teams in Europe and put them on head to head. Now the Hibs hadn't won the league that year. Aberdeen had, but they turned down the offer. Like most British clubs, they didn't consider the game to be international, but the Hibs did. They'd been all over the place, and that's why they were invited. All over South America, all over Europe. Everybody knew. The famous Edinburgh Highbies. We had played a lot abroad, and uh, in, as I say, I've been in most countries in Europe at the football club's expense. <laughs> But uh, oh, I, we were well known in Europe, and I think they were glad to get us into the competition, and we were certainly glad to play in it. That was due to the foresight of our chairman, Harry Swan, you know. It was, he, he, he was instrument, one of the um, guys who were instrumental in this, you know. He had great foresight. I would say that Hibs led the world in this. It's it starting off by going to other countries to play soccer. It was a marvel. I mean, I was a young lad, 17, 18, going abroad. I mean, that's, it was unbelievable. We travelled every, every year. Um, we were always on tour. Tour to uh, Italy, France, and Canada, America, Brazil. I'd never been further than Burnt Island, eh? And all of a sudden, my way. <laughs> and Germany and Paris and Rome and everywhere, you know. No one knew much about the team they were playing. They knew they wouldn't be a bad side. They were called Rot Weiss Essen. 
Germany had won the World Cup the year before. In fact, they'd beaten Hungary in the final and that had caused quite a shock. Rot Weiss went on to win the German League, so they were effectively the champions' champions. Half a dozen players with World Cup winners' medals and the best of the lot, an outside right called Helmut Rahn, the man that had won the World Cup and scored two goals in the final. That was the first time I flew when we actually went to Germany. I think it was Dusseldorf. Uh, and that was frightening because that was the first time I flew. You know. And it was, like a, it was like a spitfire, you know, it wasn't a big boy. <laughs> John Higgins and I were, we were on the plane, I, on the, we were the only two sitting beside, we were sitting beside each other, and when we got to the hotel, they were getting, going to get washed and changing that for the meal, covered in, body was covered in spots. When we arrived there, Tommy Younger was meeting us because Tommy was in the forces, and he was stationed in Germany. So he had made his way to the hotel. He'd been told we were staying, he'd made his way to the hotel to meet us there. And he, he, John Patterson, Tommy and I were all in the one room. And Tommy says, I've picked the best room, room such and such. So the boss, we got the boss, Sammy, eh? Sammy King came eh? but Sammy wouldn't know what to do. And they got a German doctor into the hotel and he had a look at us and he took us away in the morning. He, he gave us some type of pill or tablet or something and he, he took us to the hospital in the morning and they gave us an injection or something. Well, I, were in, I was in the hospital bed for maybe a couple of hours or something before we went back to the hotel. And when we got up there, it was so... I said, Tom, if this is the best room, what like was the worst room, you know? Sammy came into the room early in the morning, the trainer, and I was lying face down in the bed and he just pulled the covers back and said, uh, oh, you're OK, your body's all clear, eh? And I turned around, John Patterson, look at his face, and I could hardly see out my eyes. <laughs> they had to put an extra bed in this room and you had to move the bed from behind the front door to get in and out. That's how it was a, such a small room, you know? And this was supposed to be, in Tommy's opinion, the best room. Aye, that was the day of the game, aye. That was the morning of the game. And it, they took me to the hospital and they gave me some injection or something. Lay, lay in bed there for a couple of hours and then went back to the hotel. It was only ten years after the Second World War had ended that this game took place. They'd all lived through it, both sets of players. Essen was the home of the Krupps family. Their factories had built many, many weapons for the German army, and the RAF had been very busy in Essen. Well, Essen was in a terrible uh, state, as, you know, we'd been in Hamburg previously and Munich. Munich, was, you know, these countries were devastated by the, by the war, you know. They took us on a trip on a bus uh, to a certain area and passing down the road there was, oh, tremendous ruptures of 
iron steel lying around, and, and, I, and I happened to turn and say to someone, what's that there? And, oh, I said, that was the crops works, blown to bits during the war. And it was amazing just to look at it. But when you turned your head and saw on the other side the exact same buildings, or looked like the exact same buildings on the other side, all new and beautiful and engineering works burning away there. And I said, well, what's that? He said, well, that's the crops works. I couldn't believe it, because we were still in turmoil back here in Scotland or in Britain trying to repair stuff, and yet they had repaired it in no time. It was in everyone's mind, the Second World War. Most of the Hibs team were just kids. They'd been just youngsters when the war was on. But some of them hadn't. Some of them fought in it. Well, the, the war had been that long finished, you know. And Orman and I, we were in. I think we were only two. Oh, and Bobby Combe. Bobby was a prisoner of war, <laughs> Bobby Combe. Uh, we, we had been in the war, you know. So there was always this, this wee bit of... Uh, well, I think you always did when you played the Germans, yeah. There was always... I think there was always something there. I always had that something there, because my dad was killed during the war, in, you know, in France, actually. But. Uh, just get stuck in about them, I suppose, eh? I mean, it, when we went and uh, with the Hibs or uh, the Scottish team, whenever you went to Germany or Austria, you were told not to say anything that was going to cause any trouble, you know? But that didn't stop you from talking to the centre-half on the park. <laughs> Orman and I, we were in the, in the Navy, and uh, my experience of the war was the Russian convoys. I was on, on that for... Uh, Close on three years, I think it was. And uh, it was quite a rough experience, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, the thing it got is, again, the Germans were so arrogant, you know, and they, they, they still took this arrogance from the war, you know, and we were playing them directly after the war. Of course, there's this bit of, you know, this is, especially in, uh, Ormond and I in Combs' mind, you know, because we had battled against them in another, another uh, sphere there. And uh, there was this, still this bit of resume resentment, you may call it, or what have you. He was killed in Normandy. Killed in Normandy. He was at a mortar shell or something like that. Because I know, a, what was his name that played with Hibs? Derek. 
and the lad comfy Dundee, he was a wing half. Uh, his father too. His father saw my dad being killed, eh, because he, he spoke to me at Dundee, came up and spoke to me at Dundee. He's about his Dundee game and uh, he had, he'd been standing near me. He says, Tommy Preston comes from Edinburgh, I must be this, because my dad had the same name, you know. So, oh, well, before, yeah, before the game, you know, now come on, let's get into these nuts, <laughs> you know. <laughs> still had that in my mind, eh? You still, still do, actually. You know. I must admit that when you uh, when you played against the Germans, and we played against a few Germans after the war, there was some naughty words said to them about their their history. You know, that day you, know, you were all, they were all Nazi uh, gentlemen, as far as we were concerned. You know, but that's how you were brought up. I mean, I was brought up to more or less hate the Germans because it was my growing up that we were at war with the Germans. You know. You're saying that today, and people say, oh, you should never have had that in your thoughts. No, no, if you'd have been fighting the war uh, uh, and in situations that we were in during the war, you know, you don't uh, just let that drift out of your mind instantly. That stays with, with you for a while, you know. The hardships and uh, that you you had to, to bear and uh, the fears you had, you know. If the war was a factor in the minds of the Hibs players, the Germans, well, they took a different view. No, actually not. Erstens mal war ein Großteil der Spieler nicht mehr. No, not really. Uh, firstly, a large proportion of players did not become soldiers. They were born in the years when people were no longer drafted to go to war. This terrible Great War, and for this reason, we didn't think that uh, we would be playing against someone who used to be the enemy. These thoughts were just not here. We only saw them as sportsmen and people. Uh, the team presented itself as such abroad, and they presented themselves well by projecting a good image of the German people as they really are, and that they uh, distance them themselves from all that that happened uh, during this terrible Great War, what Nazi Germany did. This is how they always presented themselves. No, 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 no. No, 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 in no way. We were too much sportsmen for that. Yes, after the Second World War, we had a lot uh, to make amends for in the world, and uh, that is why the team Rot-Weiss Essen showed its best side in all the European countries we played in. We kept in touch with friends, we sought uh, contact with uh, the supporters, we exchanged uh, gifts as a gesture of friendship. This was new back then, and uh, However, uh, Rotweiss Essen uh, understood how to build relationships between people practically in the whole of Europe and the team was very popular and has uh, done a lot for German football as a result of this.
What a good side this. There's no mistake about it. A good side. You don't win the German League if you're a bad side, as is shown today. It was the same in those days. The only thought we had was their star player was supposed to be something special, a fellow called Helmut Rahn. He played outside right for the Germans when they won the World Cup in 54. Yeah, and for this guy in particular, he played uh, against Hungary in, in the World Cup final. When the Germans were massive outsiders, you know, it's in the Hungarian Pami days. And here they upset all the odds. The German Helmut Rahn, he was outside right. Good player, built as a winger, for a winger. He was so strong, built lad, you know, fast, skillful. Hel uh, Helmut Rahn. <laughs> Look, uh, we really, we were right at the top level internationally. We played against many different foreign teams, even on the American tour against Independiente, who played excellent football. Or Pindrayoy, uh, six times world champion at uh, the time uh, when we won confidently 3-0 in Buenos Aires. Okay, I must say, uh, you can see that our trademark was our coach. We uh, strictly took note of the coaches' orders and followed them through. Yeah. Yes, Rot-Weiss Essen was the team which uh, played the most international games. So we were the team which had the most international business. So we played in Southern Europe, got to know Southern European football, we were well thought of in the West. <clears throat> we took part in many games in England. Um, Rot-Weiss Essen learned a lot from these friendly games. Uh, back then they were called international friendly games. Competitions like the UEFA Cup and the Champions League came much later. And we were able to put into action everything that we learned in Europe in playing terms. And because of this, uh, we're in a position to prepare ourselves for any opponent. Honestly, the Hibs thought they could be in for a right good doing that night. They weren't quite the same team they'd been a couple of seasons before. The famous five was breaking up. Bobby Johnson had gone to Manchester City because the Hibs wouldn't give him a testimonial, so he was off. That was a big miss for the Hibs. A lot of people talk about Gordon Smith, and absolutely rightly so. But wee Bobby was the guy who could pick the lock up front. That's what everybody said. A great skill. Bobby Combe came in for him, and he was a tremendous player. But you couldn't lose one of the five without losing something. If the Hibs had lost Bobby Johnson, Rock Weiss Essen had their own problems. In their dressing room, they were struggling to get their star winger fit. Helmut Rahn was doubtful. Yes, we have our own indoor health uh, suite here and our physiotherapist back then tried everything to get at least the, the top class players like Helmut Rahn, like Franz Islacker and also Paul Jane and Willi Gräber fit again, but it wasn't enough. The build-up was all there, the excitement was there, that, that was the main thing. Everybody was bubbling, and we're all shouting back and forth to each other in the dressing room. There's such a noise going on, you'd think it was a party, we weren't going to play football. Felt it was great that you, you were actually um, playing for Britain. I mean, that's what you were actually doing, you know, you were a pioneer going to play football and, and play for Britain. You were, really, you were really proud of that, you know. Just before... Uh, 
the actual run out onto the park sure got us together. Hugh Shaw was the manager that night. He'd been a player with the Hibs, he'd been coached before he became the boss. He was a distinguished man, very, very well respected. But before this game, oh, he was cautious. We had a team talk before the game. Now, we had never played this type of game before, a home-and-home, -home, a two-legged game, you know? We, we hadn't really been any used to that. So the manager says, now, this is a good side, obviously, or there wouldn't have been the competition. Now, what we must do is try and hold them at home here. If we can keep a reasonable score here and get them back to Easter Road, we'll fancy our chances. Do your best, lads. Get stuck in now, you know, and uh, let's, let's get a result. She sort of told us to be very cautious at the start, you know to try and tire them down a bit. So that was the tactics. We were going to lie deep and let them attack and, and try and absorb their attacking. I'd have loved to have given the team talk that night. <laughs> Listen to that crowd. That crowd doesn't know your names. History is going to be made tonight. And that crowd's written it. It's all about stars and world champions. They've written their history. It's all German names. It's not for a bunch of Scottish guys. You'll see that superstar that's come to take you on. A Berlin football club? It means nothing to him. Everything that him stands for. For the green and white, tonight for Scotland, for the men down the pit, for the men coming back for the shipyards, for the bairns coming back for school. Ask him, how did the abs get on? He doesn't care. But listen to that crowd. Listen closely. You'll hear your old man. You'll hear his old man and his father and his father's father. They're all in there. The Youngers, the Higgins, the Plenderleaths, the Pattersons, the Thompsons, the Prestons, the Combs, the Turnbulls, the Ormonds, the Rileys, the Smiths. They're in there. And they're writing their history. It's about the night they were all told they were getting whipped until the boy stepped forward. You listen to that crowd. You'll hear a wee laddie. He's reading his history. It's about the night his granddad looked the world champions in the eye. He looks up at his dad. He looks up at his old man. Scared. He asks, how did my granddad ever manage that? His dad looks down at him, calm. He says, see with your granddad? It was all about heart, getting stuck in and working for your mates. <laughs>
Well, I must admit, I think that when you all ran out and you knew that they were the German champions, you, you started to think, well, you always do. Of course, if somebody uh, you've heard of is a great side, it doesn't make any difference who they are. You then feel, oh, God, this is going to be some game, you know. They had a, a lovely strip that was a, a red and a white uh, pants and such like. But, but they looked good, they were clean, they were immaculate. Uh, uh, their hair was, you know, matted down with a brow cream and that. They, they did, they looked a super, super side. And we were just the normal hip side running out, but we thought we were good as well. Tommy Younger. Tommy Younger was an excellent keeper. Big, very athletic person. Could do 100 yards in a more than reasonable time. Uh, excellent stopper of the ball. Excellent clutcher of the ball. He was doing national service in Germany at the time we were in uh, Europe and, and uh, he used to fly to and fro from uh, Germany to Edinburgh and of course the wise guy, the, the wags in the team christened him Tommy Offenbach, <laughs> flying back and forth, you know. Right back was John Higgins. The, not many people familiar with that the name. Uh, but he was a stuffy fullback, John Higgins. He came away from down about uh, Lanarkshire, somewhere in Lanarkshire, John lived. Awfully nice lad, quiet fellow, but uh, a competent fullback. Nothing flashy about him, but competent. Did a good job. Led by with uh, Johnny Patterson. Johnny was uh, versatile, he, he could play uh, fullback or centre back as they call it today, centre half in those days, you know. But again, good, fair turn of, good turn of pace, John. Two-footed, uh, and for, he wasn't the tallest of guys, but he was good near. Uh, again, very competent player. Well, where the right half was Tiger Thompson. You never heard the Tiger? Jimmy, Jimmy was a, a good player. Jimmy Thompson, uh, very aggressive for his, it was, wasn't too big, wasn't too tall, but a lot of energy and uh, a fair bit of skill and all, Jimmy. Plenderleith was centre half, Jackie Plenderleith. Um, he was a... Uh, uh, he got the reputation of being a, a, an elegant player, Flanderley. One, one of the players, uh, on a muddy day, he could go through the game without getting his pants dirty, sort of style, you know. And Preston, uh, left half. Tommy, he wasn't the fastest of players, but he had a good brain, a good football brain, big time and a good left foot. Yeah, I've uh, heard the term educated left foot. Well, uh, big time in Ormond, they had educated left uh, foot, left feet. And uh, they say it wasn't fast, but a good reader of the game. Well, forward line speaks for itself. Uh, Smith, everyone knows Smith, very talented player, fantastic skills. Wonderful two-footed player, you know. And they could shoot as well. Cross balls, varied his crosses. You know, he could hit the firm ball, float ball, could do anything with the ball virtually, you know. As I say, unscored, it a tremendous shot. Bobby Cole was inside right, who was another good player, really good player. 
we a short, stocky, determined, with a lot of, a lot of talent, uh, and could finish as well, uh, Bobby Combe. But dour, determined guy, you know, uh, great sense of humour, uh, dry sense of humour, you know. L.R., Laurie, uh, well, his record speaks for itself, you know. He's a tenacious player, very tenacious. And he was two-footed as well, and uh, good, linked up well, but his main forte was putting the ball in the back of the net, and he was exceptional at that. And brave, har hardy, hardy. Centre half taller and built more rugged than he, but made no difference to him. He was in there mixing it with him, you know, and, and uh, give him half a chance, and the ball was in the back of the net. Good, good, uh, excellent chance taker. Had a fantastic uh, engine, you know. I could run, and I could run all day, you know. I had fantastic stamina, and uh, I could pass the ball, and I could score goals. You know, I scored quite a few goals in my day for uh, for Hibs. But he had some left foot, Willie, great left foot, and pace. And he, he could, once he, he beat a player, that was the player out of the game. He had this, and it was just, he just lifted the ball over the guy, just over his, the guy's foot or his leg, and the, uh, the guy couldn't recover. He, he was quite very sharp arm and all, you know, in a way. And again, Willie could vary his crosses, and he could score goals as well. And uh, it was good near, I know. Willie, aye. We had heard of them, but uh, unfortunately we had had no contact with Scotland. We played against Nottingham Forest, we played against Arsenal, we played against Liverpool, but in Scotland uh, the first team we played against officially was uh, Hibernian uh, Edinburgh. We said that first of all we want to hold our own in this uh, new European uh, competition. That means, boys, you really have to show what you can do if you can prove yourselves internationally. And we are going to meet a team which is a big name in Scotland, which comes from a city which is generally uh, seen as pretty and is generally well known. And that's why I said you can do anything, but you mustn't make fools of yourselves. Uh, that means you have to play a brilliant game. The kickoff was at six o'clock that night, and when the Hibs ran out, a huge cheer went round the ground. There were about 8,000 fans inside, and the bulk of them were Hibs fans. Most of them were Tommies, you know, squaddies, soldiers doing their national service out in Germany. They'd come rolling up in trucks and in jeeps, and some of them were even English, and the rest came from all over Scotland, but it didn't matter. They were all Hibbies for a day. I think we had an idea that the army was the forces were going to be there, and a, a very good turnout. I do remember behind the goals, there was some British servicemen from some of the camps that must have been round about, uh, the army camps, that is, and uh, they were along to the game, and we couldn't believe hearing the, the voices behind the, the goals. Army, there was a B-A-O-R, the British Army of the Rhine, 
and of course there was a lot of Scots punters, Scots regiments there. And the evening we played the our European tie rugby's in Essen, there was a great number of the the punters there. So we had a good support. You know, we're getting plenty of encouragement. The game was evolving quickly in the 50s. Methods, formations, tactics, these were all changing. And the Germans, well, they were well ahead of the field. They'd developed a system that allowed them to win the World Cup, and it was the same system used by Rock Weiss Essen. Yes, uh, we played the uh, World Championship system because we were trained for it, and because of this we dealt with every opponent well. Yes, uh, first uh, close the game down at the back, that was essential. Then the defenders go as far as the halfway line and for this reason we kept a firm grip on our opponents. Rot Essen started the game well. In the opening minutes there were signs that there could be a repeat of Hibbs' previous visits to Germany when they'd been turned over. One of the trips we were on, we were playing uh, Cologne, who were the German champions then, and we were due to play them the next day, or two days after it, whatever. So we were out this evening, we went out for a, just a couple of hours, you know, a couple of beers and that, and here the Cologne boys are in the, in the same establishment. And <laughs> big Jock Govan, God bless him, uh, Govy was there, <laughs> and this guy had said to Jock, not time you were in, you know, we were playing them the next day. And oh, of course, we this sort of got our, you know, backs up. Went out and they, oh, they gassed us 5 2, gave us a real lesson, and they, they really did. But the Hibs had learned their lesson. Going into this game, they remembered the previous trips to Germany, the games they'd lost, and it wasn't going to happen again. But oddly enough, where we, we learned most was, and it was against the Germans or the European teams at that time, and particularly the Germans, because we would go across there uh, every close season, more or less. And uh, we, we, uh, we learned from the Germans, and uh, we used to play the top teams, and I think it was either uh, Bayern, uh, uh, München, Gladbach, it, who had won the, the German league at that time, and uh, then there was Cologne and that. And we were playing them as we would play a Scottish team. And we were getting torn apart. And between the players, we used to sit and discuss. And we decided to say, right, instead of us diving in, as we termed it, as we would do in Scotland, you know, you'd go in and... But these guys just flicked the ball away and they seemed to work in threes, you know, they always worked in wee triangles. So instead of us diving in, we, and in particular Bobby Coleman, we just lay off and pass the onus on to them. We were good at jockeying them though. Hibs, Hibs taught me how to really Jockey players, you know, keep them wide, keep them wide, you know, so they're not going to, not going to come through the middle in that, you know. We always played with uh, five, with three attacking forwards, and your inside forwards backed you up. But then we they play a different system. Now we played at five up front, more or less, which was the two in midfield ones fell back a wee bit. But we really played with five attackers, which gave you plenty of options, and we, and we were all reasonable goal scorers, the fives, you know. 
<laughs> we approach the game in a, a sensible manner, you know. Uh, when they had possession, or if they, well, they had possession of the ball, we didn't die by We just mm. stayed organised, you know. Uh, and uh, when we got possession of the ball, we used it to effect. But we, we, no way were we scared of them, because having had the experience of playing against the, the European countries before, we knew what to expect. We knew the way they would play. In a 2-3-5 lineup, it was a mixture of old heads and young rookies. The Hibs half back line, what they called the midfield in those days, was the youngest in Scotland. Thompson, Plenderleith and Preston. They'd been laddies growing up when the famous five reigned in Scotland and now they were playing alongside them. No, it was quite daunting, Jim. Um, I, I didn't really, really think too much about it. I think I was that excited, you know, that actually playing with the, the famous five. It was just marvellous. They seemed to be able to do things that <clears throat> more or less you see nowadays. But at that time, oh, they were just way ahead of anybody. They played the game for you. It was all... You took a rollick in it, things like, but... Uh, they all, they all played with the, they all played with the mouth, eh, and played with the head and the mouth, eh, and made the game easy for you. What amazed me about the, 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 the famous five is they never stuck to a plan. One minute you would Gordon Smith in the right wing, they'd be, the next minute they'd be over on the left wing, and then uh, Lord Riley would be over on the right wing. They'd be, they would, they would just change, and the defence must have caused the, the defences, you know, like, oh, terror. To play behind the forward line like that it was so easy. You know, you just, there was something there that you knew was going to happen, and it did. It was so easy to pass the ball, put it between men and such like, and they were on it. I remember I used to, I used to get uh, into trouble with uh, a few of them, because when play, playing in defence, sometimes you controlled the ball and there was nothing you could do with it, but there was space, and I used to run through the space, and a few times I went as far as up the right wing or up the left wing and cross the ball, you know. And the famous Lights Laurie says, this is not your job, Jackie, you get back in defence, and Eddie would say, you're not supposed to be down here, you know, and, and of course, being a, a youngster, I said, OK, OK, you know, I'll do what I'm told, yeah. And after about a quarter of an hour, we decided that we weren't going to lie back, we were going to attack. We just decided ourselves, oh, we can have a go at this team. We, we never stayed back, we attacked, because you, we, we were an attack inside. And we had five forwards, all five capable of scoring the goals. We always liked to attack down the wings, which even to this day I think is neglected quite a bit. But we were very strong down the wings with, with uh, Willie Ormond and Gordon Smith. We Actually, I believe I'm the first uh, a British player, or scored the first goal, a British player to score the goal in the European Cup.
The rain was a big factor in the game. The Germans didn't like it. Their tactics relied on long 30-yard passes from defence for their forwards to run onto. Kuken, Kuken, longer pass. But the rain added weight to the ball. And it was like trying to kick a sack of potatoes. It was not a night for long passes. It wasn't right for our game because these passes, which we usually play because of the heaviness of the ball, which uh, would never happen today, I suppose, uh, but the ball got heavier and heavier. I never ever liked playing with heavy. I mean, the folks say nowadays the ball, the plays were much lighter and the balls we played with were much heavier, which they were. And when we played, when we played the Rangers at Ibrox, Hibs were convinced that the Rangers always steeped the ball in water to make it heavier for their style of play and thought it wouldn't suit our style of play, you know? It ch ch changes your game, obviously, if it's a, if it's a wet, wet uh, ground and the, the ball's heavy. You, you, and when the ball was heavy, then the ball was heavy, you know, so you, you would actually play a, a, short, a short passing game because you, you couldn't get the, the distance with the ball, you know? Because I already played over there before and knew in what conditions they were playing in, in these Scottish and English clubs. Uh, so we said we've got no chance, we can't beat them today. As in Scotland, we are, we are, we are used to the, 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 wet, the wet grounds and the muddy grounds more than what they are anywhere else. But that, that's not true with Germany, because Germany's got the same climate. You know, but, so if uh, I see maybe one of them said that uh, Oh, it was because it was a wet night and we couldn't, we couldn't have pushed the ball this way and that was it. was the same for both, both teams, you know. No, no, never hope. No, no, not at all, never. We thought, OK then, if, if they come here, then we are going to hammer them. It was obvious, but uh, that was uh, the kind of weather that these people used to play football in. And for us it was uh, bloom and awful weather. What I remember in the dressing room at half time when we went in, we were absolutely soaked and there wasn't another strip for us to get to put on, unfortunately. We just remember that uh, we had to squeeze some of the stuff out of our shirts and such like to go back out again. We couldn't see any way that we weren't going to add to that, you know. The manager was quite rough, you know, he was all fair away with himself, but then everybody was quite happy to go in two up. I don't think the Germans would be feeling too happy in their dressing room. The Eltern Sitzung schon angesprochen, dass wir heute hier vor den paar Zuschauern, die da sind, uns vernünftig verabschieden. Das wir vor allen Dingen auch in den letzten Wochen ganz gut bewiesen, ja, dass wir gegen die Mannschaften, als Heiligenhaus oder die anderen Gegner, <coughs> letztendlich beherrschen. Konzentration her kann es eigentlich nur 100% geben an weiter Sieger. Achtet noch den Platz, Domme, ne, dass wir abziehen. Ne, Rasen ist nass, ihr habt es gesehen beim Torschusstraining, da brauchst du nicht ganz groß. So wahnsinnig feste, der kriegt alleine Fahrt, sobald wir <lacht> letztendlich der Ball einigermaßen machen und denkt dran, ne, abgeprallte Bälle vielleicht zusammen mit dem Tappe dahinter ist. Okay, ich wünsche euch aber viel Glück, auf geht's. Komm, komm, komm!
that at night, they couldn't contain us. We were away, we struck great form, you know. Getting there, we got a goal after 20 minutes, and that, the confidence boosts the flows then, you know. Uh, and everybody wants the ball when you get in front, you know, and this was it. We all want, everybody wanted the ball and just stroked it about, played it about. being pressed at the time, the ball came through an opening and all I could think of was get it back up the park and I had a quick look, it was under lights of course, and a quick look up and I saw Eddie Turnbull in the centre half away up the middle and I gave it the hardest kick I could possibly give it. Tiger slotted this ball through, you know, a lovely pass through to me. It hit the ground before Eddie and the centre half moved and slipped and the ball went past him. Eddie was onto it like a streak of lightning. I just sort of I ran onto it and just clocked it. And bang into the back of the net. And I, I didn't have to break straight or anything, you know. I just had to run onto the ball and I hit it. And it ended up in the back of the net. Tactic. Tactics? What can you do? It's like this. We were laying on the pitch uh, more than we were playing on it. We couldn't make uh, anything of it on the day. You could say it was jinxed. But we did uh, everything we could to win the game and the team was being cheered on by the, by the supporters. Despite the wet weather, there were a lot of supporters at the match, but we didn't have uh, the playing skills to beat such an excellent team from Edinburgh. But the players were not there to beat such an excellent team from Edinburgh. None of the German lads could speak much English. I think it's maybe better nowadays. Than and none of our lads could speak German, I can assure you. Now, nowadays, we have players in the team that are Germans, you know. So, uh, no, there was no... Nazi was the only one that I could, I could speak in, that, that they could understand. And they knew my thoughts about the Germans of these days. It, it's a clean, I could assure you, although it was muddy and all the rest of it, it was the cleanest game I've played in. There was no dirty tricks or anything. It was a super game, in fact. I think they were beginning to get the word, the, the stick at the finish from their supporters, you know, because they were, they were outclassed. Just good football. They did take umbrage a wee bit when you called them Nazi baskets, you know. Nazi, Nazi, no, no, they didn't they want to be known as Nazis, you know. But that's how we were brought up, hating the Nazis.
We were all quite devastated after the game that we lost so badly. We couldn't believe that we could lose so badly in the first match of the European Cup, when it was uh, really all about European honor. Das haben wir uns im ersten Europapokalspiel oder in einem, ein, in einem Spiel, wo es wirklich um äh, europäische Ehren ging, haben wir nicht geglaubt, dass wir so hoch verlieren. Ja, nachdem wir. Ja, yeah, um, we were hoping that we would beat them here and the weather, I would say, wasn't typically uh, Scottish but English as they always say here, so that we thought it is not looking good for us today because they are experienced in playing on pitches like, like the one uh, we now had in front of us. That is, that is exactly how it went, uh, we got a real dressing down. The, the incident to me that sticks out in my mind is the game is coming to an end and uh, Smith hit this ball and the ball ends up in the back of the net. The referee's whistle had blown, see? So it couldn't have been for a foul or it couldn't have been for a, 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 any decision against Gordon Smith. He, he, he shot the ball and the ball ends up in the back of the net. So we don't know whether the sc we've scored four or five. We thought it was, it was a goal, but the referee, we approached the referee after the game. You know, this was the final whistle. He said, and the ball hadn't crossed the line when the final whistle blew. So there was no goal. took it very well and I think they knew that when they came to Easter Road they were not going to win four goals back, you know. Well, they were a great side, they all shook our hands at the end of the day, <clears throat> but of course some of us didn't speak German, but uh, I'm quite sure that they were saying well done lads, just as we did to them. Swap shots in those days. No. There was nothing of that at all. In fact, I don't think the Hems would have tried to get the bloody things back with playing on them Saturday again. <laughs> this right back was giving Orman a, well, a torrid time, you know. It was... So when the game was finished, the job was done, you know. So I just reminded this guy, I went up to him, just a nice term, you know. Soft voice told them, I'll have you <laughs> when you come to Edinburgh. <laughs> they had more brain than I thought they had because they never came. <laughs> they didn't turn up. Obviously, when you look at the records, it must have been a great achievement. To me, it was just a, it was just a, a game of football and uh, we won. And that was, that's, that's what you're out to do is to, is to win, win the game. You know? Sunshine on 
And it'll always go down in the records that the Hibs were the first British team to play in Europe. And it'll always go down in the records that Eddie Turnbull was the first British player to score in Europe. In that time, Hibs were the only, the only football side, and, and real football side, in Scotland, aye, and, and maybe England, because we proved it in England and all. The stories always come back up when you, when you watch games yourself up at the golf club or something, and some of the lads will say, uh, Tiger, I said, I bet you wish you were there. I said, I was there long before these blocks were there. I said, I was one of the first. In fact, I said, I'd be the first because it was the first European game. Tottenham, we used to go down and play Tottenham, Manchester United. It was a walk in the park for Hibs. Anybody go back to the records? Went down to White Hart Lane and 5 2 beating Tottenham, Ditchburn, Bill Nicholson, Alf Ramsey. Eddie Bailey, you name them, they were there, but the old had turned it on, done them. And they look at you in amazement, and you try to tell them something, and they try to pull your leg back, and I said, you don't pull my leg, I said, I was there and I've done it, and that's all that worried me, and it was great. Manchester United, oh. Walk in the park, all their great names, Jack Rowley, and a lot of them, you know, great players they were. But they couldn't match the hibs. We were the team. <laughs>